Hi, Dan Nelson here with a real short video that will show you what you might expect if you actually sign up for one of my online art classes. So Hank, in, uh, my friend in the Netherlands, sent me this painting. He sent a, a digital image and I edited it in Photoshop and cropped it and fixed it up and so off and printed it on canvas. So this is exactly what I will do with your painting. So there's several things that, that I wanted to say. First of all, let's, let's commend Hank. I said you're obviously a very good draftsman. You're good at drawing. You're good at perspective. I love the element of little smokestacks sticking up. This, I, I recognize this is one of the canals over there. And uh, Hank was in particular asking me about this painting because in it he used my technique, which is the acrylic, transparent acrylic glazes underneath and oil on top. And yay, Hank, for doing that. Good job, especially down here in the water. I love the, the interplay of the surprising, that's a really good word when it comes to color in a painting, surprising color, surprising color down here in the water. Again, a good draftsman. There's a little blue car over here, a row of boats uh, and sailboats on this side with the mast sticking up. Good job, Hank, and I'm honored that you would ask me for my input. Now, a couple things that I came back to Hank with. One was, the first one is the plain old-fashioned law of thirds. And this is the kind of thing that Hank knows this law very well, but when you're painting, you forget things, right? You're so focused on something else that you forget that. So this is what we all do. So here is, you know the law of the thirds, don't you? I'm sure you do. Let me, let me draw it real quick for you. Just for the, both of you that don't know what it is. <laughs> I guess I'm assuming everybody else does. When you have a canvas, such and such, like that, your major vertical lines should be on the one-third or the two-third lines, and your major horizontal lines, that is to say most of the time, if it's a landscape, your horizon, should be either one-third from the top or one-third from the bottom. Okay, so it's actually a tic-tac-toe shape that you would superimpose over your canvas. Now that's general, that's a rule of thumb. Every rule of thumb can be broken, but you have to know the rule first before you know how to break it with panache. You have to break it with a certain, uh, you have to make, you have to be able to explain why doesn't this apply in, in this case, in this painting. So I, I shared that with Hank and he understood immediately and agreed with me that it would have been better if this painting had, uh, so which would you do? Would you cut it, would you crop it, uh, say here, or would you crop it here? I bet you most of you are gonna agree with me and say, the water is more interesting than the sky. So if Hank had cropped it, the sky down here, it would have been a better composition. And also, he's got his focal point, or the, the perspective point, which is in essence a focal point, right here in the middle too, would have been better. So the next thing I did, and again, I would do this with your painting, if you'll send it to me if, if it's needed, I cropped it. So let me show you this up close. So I cropped the sky down, so now the horizon is one third from the top, and I cropped it from the right, so that now the focal point is one third from the right. Does that make sense? Good, glad you got it. So that was one of the things that I mentioned to Hank right off. Now the next thing that I mentioned to him was this thing that I call boundary ratios. And I got this from my good friend, Bob Rankin. And what a boundary ratio means is you look at the boundary of your painting, the four boundaries, if it's a square painting or a rectangle painting, the four boundaries, there's one, two, three, four. You should look at how many color shapes, breaks there are along each boundary. For instance, here on the right, there are basically two shapes. One, two. On the other side, there's basically two again. One, two, although maybe we could call it three. One, and then the greenish tree area, three. So let's call this one three. One, two, three. Over here, it's one, two. So far, so good. The bottom, we might call it, there's a little bit of a, a railing down here, so that helps break it up perhaps a little bit. It's not quite strong enough to break up this dark. So I think we call it one, and then the light area two, and then the dark area three. So on this side, three, this side, the bottom three, this side two, here's the big problem. At the top, there's one. And most of the time, a boundary ratio number of one is a problem. Most of the time. Now, it's a rule of thumb, so it can be broken, but if you don't know the rule, you're probably not breaking it right. And this is very, 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 very common in landscapes because the, the artist says, oh, the sky's blue, and there's sky up there, so the, the top of the painting, so the top boundary, just as hanged in here, is all blue. So what can you do about that? Here's a real easy fix. Almost always in sky, you can incorporate some kind of cloud formation that violates, if you will, that punches through this top. Now we have a, we have a ratio, boundary ratio of number of three at the top. Blue, white, blue. See it? So real easy fix. Now. Look, while I'm on the subject of landscapes and boundary ratios, let me, 
Let me introduce one other thought. Anytime that you're painting some subject matter and there's any item in the, in the scene at all that is tall, even tall-ish, <laughs> whenever possible, you should try to have that tall-ish object violate or punch through the top of the painting. Let's say you're painting a Victorian mansion and the Victorian mansion has a peak or a widow's watch or you know a, an architectural element that at the top that's real maybe even chimneys, tall chimneys. Again if you want it to look as it really is in real life the, the feeling of those buildings is tall. Your intuition might say well I want to show how tall they are, how tall they are so I'm going to include them in the whole painting. Contrary to your intuition cut the top of it off and it will actually look taller. People, if they see a house like this, they know that the, the house comes to a peak. They really don't need to see it. They don't need to see the absolute tip tip top of the Empire State Building. Let me go back to uh, the, the craft version that I did. One mass and I extended it up over the boundary. I violated it and it makes it, ah, what can you say? Human beings like to see things punching through the top boundary. Now, the next thing I did with Hank is we talked about atmospheric perspective and kudos to Hank he did such a good job on the factory it makes it look he made it look like it's far away he told me while we were online by the way that he painted it I think like three or four different times before he got it just the way he wanted it so kudos to Hank again for sticking hanging in there and getting it right but the trees are basically the same color here all the way down to here and same color here down to here and again when I was talking to Hank he went kind of like I know better than that and I, I, I understand it. I believe you did. Here in Photoshop, I just did a, a haze there and you can see how much more atmospheric it looks when, when that is done. And now a couple other things. So let's talk about this bank of trees right here. One of the things I talked about with Hank is if you're painting from a photograph, and this is probably most of you most of the time, right? Unless you're plein air painting. When you're painting from a photograph, as I do, well, let me, let me start here and say the number one mistake, far and away, that I've been painting my whole life, the number one mistake I make when I'm painting from a photograph is what? I believe, I follow, I copy, I make myself a slave to the photograph. That's the number one mistake that I make. And it's also the number one mistake that most of you make. In other words, you make yourself a slave to the photo. I belong to a, a, a painting group. We get together once a month. And it's become almost a, like a, a running joke among us. Somebody will put up a painting. It's a you know, mutual critique group. We put up a painting and we're talking about it and talking about it. And somebody in, the, somebody in the group will say, well, you know, why'd you do that right there? And you know, can you predict the answer that's coming in light of what I'm talking about? What will the artist say? Well, it was that way in the... <laughs> I don't even have to finish the sentence, do I? It was that way in the photograph. <laughs> And by that time, we all burst into laughter because we have all heard this so many times. Yay, Verily, we have all done this so many times, you know? Why, why'd, you do, why'd you do that? Well, it was in the photograph. So let me, let me go back to Hank's painting here. Uh, and that was exactly the answer that he gave. You have to remember that when you're painting, let me take notes here. Let me write, this is, this is worth writing down, okay? When you're painting from a photograph, a photo always... Now, I suppose, unless it's done by a real professional, which some of you may be, but most of us aren't, the lights are too light, the lights are too, that's the key word, the lights are too light, and what? The darks are too dark. Got it? That is the danger. Photographs, you may have heard this expression before, photography flattens things out. That's what it means. In other words, if we had been standing with Hank on, the, on this bridge over this canal, and if we had looked at these trees, our eye would have easily, easily picked up variations in this color. I don't even mean just um, uh, atmospheric. Yes, that too. But even here in this close area, there would be a lot, a wide range of values and colors and our the camera does not pick that up the camera just records it as <clears throat> one flat dark area you understand same thing with the sky the sky the camera just picks it up most of your photographs the sky is just a, a blown out white right so you have to remember when you're working from a photograph don't let that happen you think now wait a minute wait a minute the photograph is only a vague reminder of what this scene looks like don't copy it verbatim from the photograph because the photo is lousy, right? My photos are lousy. Most of yours are too, unless you work for National Geographic. You know what I mean? Okay, so we talked about this and, and I did a real quick demo. Where is it? Here it is. I did a real quick demo for Hank where I took a piece of canvas 
and said, let's imagine using my technique where we, uh, we do the layers of transparent acrylic underneath. And here I used phthalo blue, purple, and brown. And, and again, you, this, criti this criticism is not based only on my technique. This is just the way you do it. If you paint the way I'm painting, you do it in the underpainting. Three colors, and there's a, there's, I think I'll, I'll let you come in real close here. There's a wide variety of tones and, and even some variety in values in here. Does that make sense? And then, we, and then we came in with the sky holes and punched holes into that, of course. The next thing I shared with Hank was some touches of color. He has just a tiny bit of red on these two flags. And my first suggestion was, hey man, you got some color there, punch it. Here's a general rule of thumb. Human beings like color. More color generally is better than less color. So what I suggested to Hank was that he, in fact, incorporate some, some color. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this. I'll just make it too big so you can get the idea. Instead of that color red, make it this color red. And of course, maybe two. And then, if he did that, then how about take some of that same red and find a part of the boat over here and make it red as well. Do you see how much how nice that is compared to just the, the plainness that was there? I also suggested to him, this is just too late for this painting, don't worry about it. But he's got a car and a fairly well finely rendered car here. How about if he had had the car going the other way so he had a tail light there and then had reflection of the tail light in the water? Do you see? Again, I'll bring you in real tight here. Do you see what a nice difference that makes just right there? So we have color here and color here. By the way, one of the rules of thumb is if you have color somewhere in your painting, yeah, try to have it somewhere else. Again, that rule can be broken. It can also be taken too far. It's not a, it's not a hard law, it's a soft law. <laughs> it's a good idea to keep in mind most of the time. It's getting down to the last couple of things that I, that I mentioned to Hank. What I call the porch railing syndrome. This is partly because I, myself, I do a lot of architectural paintings. I do a lot of paintings of houses. Let me describe for you, first of all, it's real easy, the porch railing syndrome. Now it applies to all kinds of things. It applies to Hank's painting, but I call it this simply because it's easy to remember. So let's say we're doing a painting of a house, okay? Again, so like I mentioned, sort of a, a Victorian style house and it's got a porch railing, ba 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 some stairs here, ba 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 porch in the, okay, got, got the idea? This is a porch dark in here okay and the sun is coming from this side so here's where the light is coming from right and in the photograph or even if you're standing there on the sidewalk painting as i would do many times in painting a scene like this i'm i'm there on location the sun often is hitting the whole front of this house so let's say this this house is a major element not not just a little piece of the painting but it's a major part of the painting it's i'm doing a painting of a house get it the sun is hitting the whole railing. This is the porch railing syndrome. What do I do? I paint the whole railing with the sun shining on it. <laughs> you might have missed it. <laughs> this, is a, this is bad. This is a bad thing to do. In other words, I have a certain degree of brightness, lightness, you know, warm light from the sun hitting here, and it's hitting here, 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 all the way across. And you can say, well, What's wrong with that? That's what it's in the photo. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> that's what's that's what it is happening. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you don't copy a photo. If you want, if you're doing a painting of fairly anything like that's fairly big and the sun's hitting it, let me give you a good tip. Don't make the sun hit the whole thing. Either somehow between it outside the picture frame, if this is the picture frame, outside the picture frame, there's a big tree or a big building or a cloud in the way, something like that. So let's say on this side, this end is in shade and this end is in sun. Did you catch that? Or the other way around. Or maybe the middle is in sun and both ends are in shade or vice versa. In any case, the porch railing syndrome is when the sun is hitting the whole porch railing so you paint the whole thing in sunlight. Eh, bad mistake most of the time. Every rule can be broken, but you better know the rule first before you break it or you won't be doing it right. Now, let's apply that to Hank's painting. What's happening here? It's exactly what I just described. We have this long band. Now let's imagine that we have already atmospheric perspective, so it's light down, lighter down here. Let's pretend that's already fixed. But the sun is sit hitting this whole bank of trees equally. So that's what it was doing, obviously, in the photograph, and that's exactly what Hank painted, just like most of us would. 
got it. And I suggested to him, Hank, what would happen if these trees were in shadow and even further down, even though we would have atmospheric that is in shadow, and what would happen if the water in the foreground was in shadow and instead of the whole thing being bathed in sunlight, there's a cloud in the way and, and the foreground is dark, these trees are dark, and then that allows us to do some really cool things. Then where the light is hitting this boat, we have just some dazzling sunlight hitting the boat right there and maybe this boat. Are you with me? All of a sudden this painting, and then the, the water has, takes on, a, and then we have some reflection here, of course. Hank did a good job with reflection. And then the water here where the sun is coming across is brighter and lighter and so forth. Does that make sense? See how much better that looks? Dark, light, dark and a shaft of light coming across here. All of a sudden it's turned this rather uh, ordinary image into extraordinary image. And it, it doesn't matter what's making that shadow. It doesn't matter that it's not in the photograph. You invent it because you're smart, smarter than the photograph. Okay, then I had just one other comment with Hank's painting. I'm getting, and I confess here, I'm, I'm getting pretty fussy. This is by no means a complaint. Um, but he had these trees are pretty much all the same color green. So I have here some some uh, yellow ochre or raw sienna, I don't know which it is, on my brush. And I'm going to take this one tree right here and turn it just a little bit more yellow. See? One tree. Then I'm going to take, uh, put on some purple lavender on my brush. And I'm going to take this tree right here and do a pale lavender on it. So that was basically all the content that I gave to Hank. Now I'm very excited to tell you that after our class was over, Hank sent me back his painting that he had modified. And here it is right here. So you can see he didn't crop it because understandably it's pretty hard to crop a painting when it's done. So he said, you know, he couldn't do that, but everything else he did. So he put some clouds up here to break up the top ratio. Kudos. He incorporated lots of color in here. Great job, Hank. He incorporated lots of color in here. He did the red here on the boat, the red here. And I feel like the most, the biggest thing is he darkened this and did this light, this thing here. Whoa, way to go. Fantastic. Man, if I could see all my students make that kind of progress after just one class, I would be ecstatic. So I hope this is helpful. Thanks, Hank, for, Hank, for letting me use you as a uh, public example. Keep on painting, my friend. And uh, the rest of you, if you'd like to sign up, eventually we'll have several people, you know, attending one class at the same time, and you'll be able to see these principles applied to a number of paintings all at the same time. So you see where to, where to, where to sign up here. Thanks again for watching. Keep on painting.